Hello everyone, it's Chris and uh, welcome back to our channel. I had a few questions about Advent of Code and uh, what my setup looks like, why I make certain choices, and um, how I approach Advent of Code in general. And so I just wanted to share quickly the preparation steps I go through for each day, why I'm using certain aspects of, of my code and the benefits that it gives me with working through these problems methodically. So first, in the middle of Advent of Code, currently getting ready for day six, and the first thing you need to do is make sure that Go is installed in your machine. I'm currently using a 2022 M2 MacBook Air uh, to develop on, although I have a MacBook Pro for work. It works just fine, but you just need to install Go. You can follow the instructions on the website. I'm not going to bore you with that, but just make sure Go is installed. That would be the first step. I'm currently using Go 1.2.1.3. That's close enough to the latest, um, but make sure you're running the latest. That way you're running performant. Um, that's number one. The second thing is make sure you have a good IDE so or development environment. I know we've got some Vim kitties out there. So if you prefer using Vim, I use Vim in a lot of different scenarios. Uh, but for my day-to-day -day driving with Go, I personally prefer VS Code. It has a lot of integrated tools that make my development life a lot easier. And so I use the tools that are comfortable with me. Um, is it the fastest? Yeah, it's fast enough. Um, I don't need anything necessarily fancy. So VS Code. Third is the way I structure my project. So with my project, I'm using something called Cobra uh, that can be found uh, here at this location. Uh, what Cobra is, it's a tool that helps you build command line applications in Golang, and it allows you to stitch commands together and have global and local parameters. It's really nice for creating complex CLI tools. Now, in this case, I'm... I've just structured in a way where I wanted to have access to my commands. And so I, I didn't really do anything too fancy other than uh, create a year day structure for my commands. So what that means is every day when I come in here to prepare, I really just copy and pasting the previous day, renaming it to day six and then because we're going into day six and then clearing out my input, clearing out my test and changing this to day six. We leave test parts the way it is. We're gonna reduce it down to one test in our table and I'll explain that in a second. We'll come back to this and that is that. We also have to change this to day six and then this to day six, we save that. And the last step here is adding day six. Okay, cool. So that gives us this ability with Cobra to keep adding year after year, or command, not day D, day six. Uh, day after day. So we still have our old stuff that we've done. But we also have our new stuff. And I'm, I, I plan to push this up as a project and at some point. I just haven't. So now since we've added our command, this gives us this ability to do a go run uh, the year and then the day. And so you can see here part one, part two. Uh, we'll go into here and we'll just comment out part two for now. And then a couple basics. Um, we're going to delete everything else in this file and we're going to return just zero here, zero, not O. Um, and then we're going to get rid of everything else. So we don't need extra stuff in here. Yeah, get rid of all that. And we're going to run our test, just make sure our test works. So uh, what I mean by test working is that execution works. We don't have any issues. And this is all just kind of in prep. So I can, this is all my prep work that I do. Okay. So uh, that's what Cobra is, kind of the prep work there. But it allows us to do CLI building. So we're going to build a base command. And it allows us to 
build and run this command very easily. That's not a requirement, that's just what I do to keep things structured, keep things compartmentalized. My one.txt file is the actual input and the test.txt file or txt file is the testing input. That's the approach I chose to go with. So let's talk about a couple of other principles that I've used in the other days of Advent of Code. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that Advent of Code is a lot of file parsing of different file types. So you need to be familiar with a couple of things. Uh, strings.split is a big one, um, as well as regex as being another possibility for parsing these files. It's also very often that these files are broken up into chunks of different types. And so the faster you can parse the file, the faster you can start actually coding against the problem. So sometimes a good bit of the time is just figuring out how you're gonna split the file up. And that does also change with how you're gonna solve the problem. So we take one example here. Um, if I look at our beginning data, almost always the part one is going to do some sort of read file and then do some sort of split on the lines. So if we look at um, a previous day, if we're looking at day five, our part one here takes in an input and it does a four iterator. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this. And what this line does here is it takes, it'll take our string and it'll iterate on it. It'll split it. And generally, um, it's just a single hard return, so that's the slash n. And this allows us to iterate line by line in the file. Now, depending on our file format, we might have to do things more complex, but that at least gives us a way to, to start processing line by line. From there, we're gonna use other techniques depending on what the input looks like. So if we go to like day one, for instance, and we go to command, we've done some different things here where not only are we splitting the file, um, but we're going through character by character. Day two, on the other hand, um, not only do we split the file, but we also split on comma. And that's because our input look like this. So it allows us to break the file apart. So understanding what a string split is, or just being able to split strings easily, and then also being able to use regexes will allow you to very quickly uh, write parsers. I think, what was it, day four, I used a regex. And so this allowed me to, what I did was, we had some extra spaces, and so just to quickly kinda find them, I replaced all strings, I replaced all instances of multiple spaces with a single space, which allowed my parsing to be just on space. But again, that's a technique that is good to, to know how to do. Um, we're just gonna print line line. So it stops here. So that's one part there. Honing your skills on parsing different file types. The more uh, you can think about how you break apart a file and parse it manually, the better you're gonna get at advent of code. That's, that's always the first challenge. How do we break it apart into logical bits of data? Also knowing your data structures. Are you gonna break it into a map or a string or a slice of string or how is the data gonna be represented? Okay, so moving on from that, uh, file parsing, it's crucial for solving your puzzles. All right, so let's talk about TDD. So every advent of code problem always provide some sort of test input. So like on day five, this was the test input with some sort of with some sort of answer to that particular part. So like in this case, it was 35 if, if we coded everything correctly. So typically when I read through the problem, I'm gonna grab that out and I'm gonna go into my test file. So if we close all these out and we go to day six, uh, if we go to our test, I already have a test structured here. So I would come into test six and I would give it an expected value and part one would be my function. Um, the reason I'm doing that is because we have a known set of input and a known set of output. So that means that I can run my test as many times as I want and I can get an idea of the level of accuracy. Now, as you've seen in some of my videos in the past, their test cases don't necessarily cover every edge case. 
I think that's intentional, but it gives you a maybe a false sense of security because not all the edge cases are covered. Now, if I was developing this for my day-to-day -day job, I would build more tests covering those test cases. But because we're just dealing with solving a particular problem here, uh, I, I generally don't expand those test cases. And instead, I just kind of interactively work in the problem itself. In addition to testing, there's a package that I use that I find quite handy, which is this testify package and specifically taking advantage of the assertion functionality. So the reason why that's important is because it allows me to do shorter hand assertions about errors, uh, errors and uh, equality. Um, there's a lot of other methods in there like is null, is error, no error, etc. In this case, I can do some sort of function and then I can say assert that there is no error in the error field, provide the input if it returns an error. I can also say assert that the expected is equal to the result of our test function being executed. And so that's all done from a table driven perspective. So this gives me the ability to just quickly type out tests and have assertions done in shorthand um, inside Go. And honestly, I think this is probably one of the best packages in regards to testing in the Go ecosystem. Go in its base form has good testing practices in itself, but it's super helpful. So the way you create a test is generally the convention is whatever your file you're testing, the, your methods that you're testing is in underscore test uh, dot go. And inside here, you're gonna start all of your functions with the word test with a capital T, and then generally what method you're testing. So in this case, it's either part one or part two because of the way I've used the function injection Typically, I would have a separate method or, to, or rather a separate test for each method or function, but this just gives me a shorthand way of iterating on this a little bit faster. Then the other thing is, is that it must be able to be provided the T testing structs, uh, which is what you see here. And so this allows you to do different things, different error handling, etc., which is what gets passed to the assert package. The last thing here that you see is what we have is a table driven tests. So let's explore that for a second. So the reason I really like table driven tests and I've, I've come accustomed to it is that it gives you the ability of quickly expanding. I have a good test here. It's for the parts function. I know we have some sort of expected outcome. We have some sort of input. We have some sort of function. Uh, what I'm doing here is a, basically an anonymous function declaration so that I can inject, as long as they follow the same pattern, I can inject newer functions. And so this allows me to quickly iterate and test different scenarios, see if we get to the same result. But I can expand this if I get a input one, if I get a test two, if I test three, if I have different test scenarios, I can add them all here. So that's why I use test driven development. These are all kind of the things that I do in advance um, just to make sure that when I get into the actual coding, I can stay focused on the coding and not dealing with uh, startup costs. In, in this case, I find these things to, to provide power, uh, to provide speed to my development process so that I can stay focused on the problem. So there you have it. We covered the essentials of setting up Golang for admin to code challenges, including the Cobra package for CLI, regex for parsing, file parsing techniques, testing in TDD, the testify package, and table-driven tests. I hope this guide helps you tackle your coding challenges with confidence. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Happy coding, and best of luck with Envenom Code. See you next time.